Uh, anyway, let's pray today. Um, I really do appreciate the technology that the Lord has provided, uh, but let's not forget it's been provided through the hard work and, and, um, uh, and leadership of a, of a number of people. And so I just really am so grateful that we've been able to, uh, to connect as a body and to continue to worship together, even though uh, a few of us have been in this building and others have been in your homes, uh, to be able to bring the Word of God to you. The Word of God is not bound. If Paul could say the Word's not bound when he was in prison, we can certainly say the Word's not bound during this season that we're, be, that we're in. Uh, but I want us to pray now. I do believe we're, we're in a series called The Blood Covenant, or simply Blood Covenant. Uh, I really do believe this is an important time. This is an important series uh, that we're in. Uh, I, I believe that the Lord has in His heart, has on His heart, a people who are absolutely confident of the covenant that He has paid for. Uh, I tell you, the more I personally delve into this, uh, individually, personally, even as Robert has shared, uh, you know, I'm, do, I'm, I'm delving into this for myself, Steve the person, not just Steve the preacher and pastor. The more I delve into it, uh, into this blood covenant personally, and then the more I delve into it as one responsible to bring the Word of the Lord uh, to a congregation of people, the more I become convinced that this is the timing of the Lord. And that on the other side of this, both this season of COVID-19, that we are now in, we're now to begin the exit of that in some form or fashion. But we will not be the same as those who entered it. And, and part of what I believe the Lord wants to do today and, and next week and, and the next week or two after that in, in terms of our sermons uh, is I believe He wants to impart to our understanding but also to our hearts just how committed He is to certain things. And this is about raising our expectations, not just our hope, but our spiritual expectations. Uh, you, you know, we need to expect more of God than we've been expecting of Him. I hope you can hear the heart that I'm saying that from. God wants us to expect more of Him than we have expected of Him. He has paid, the blood of Jesus paid an enormous price. And as wonderful as it is to be free from my sins, what he paid for is so much greater than me being free from my sins. The covenant that he has purchased is so much more vast than I have ever thought or imagined. And if I lived to be 150 years old, I would not even begin to exhaust the depths the breadth, the height of this covenant that God has made through the blood of Christ. But I'll tell you, my hope and prayer is that in this series together as a congregation, we will at least make a dent in that. We will at least venture a little further in that. Uh, I, I was sharing with Brian and uh, perhaps Robert, I think we were together earlier. Uh, one of the things I envision as we come back together is a people who God has done such a deep work in their hearts. Uh, he can look around and pick at will those whom he can look at and say, I choose today. It's my desire today to release mountain moving faith for that person's benefit. And I choose you to be the conduit through which I want to move. That, I believe, is one of the things God wants to do in this congregation. He wants a host of people, and He can just choose at will. Today, I'm going to choose you. Uh, no, I'm going to choose you now. I'm going to choose you. And each and every one of us have been so molded and made ready by our revelation and understanding of the blood covenant and the, the points of the blood covenant uh, that we can be used with great authority and power. So if you can hear my heart, that's just one of the many, many things. If I go, if I go on, the, the introduction will be longer than the sermon. So uh, let's move on. Holy Spirit, I'm asking right now for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I ask God that, that 
that all that I have prepared today to preach and to teach, uh, you would go fo so far beyond my expectation, so far beyond my personal revelation, so far beyond my personal understanding, that Holy Spirit, you would be the teacher of New Life Church today in this Word. We invite you to do that. We honor you in that place. And we thank you, God, that that's one of the things you have covenanted to be for us. And we expect it of you today with great gratitude and thanksgiving. In the authority of the name of Jesus, amen. So let's move into the sermon today. We are, uh, as I said, uh, in a series called Blood Covenant. I don't, is, this, is this on here? Nope. See, that used to take me 30 seconds to figure it out. And now I can figure I just need to turn it on in three seconds. So we're making progress. Okay. So this blood covenant that we are talking about, let's remember that Jesus, when he was in that upper room, that last night before the crucifixion with his disciples, the folks that he had trained for three and a half years, uh, and he had this this last supper with them, uh, and, and, he had, and he had broken the bread, and he had spread the bread amongst them and said, take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. And then we pick it up, Paul writes, in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. What he was saying was, this represents the new covenant that is about to be made through my blood. Uh, I'm not going to try to re-preach what I've already preached over the previous three or four sermons. I hope if you haven't heard those, you'll go back and listen because it's foundational to where we want to go. But for, for time's sake, I don't want to go back and say that again. I want to make one comment and then move on. In the mind of God, a covenant sealed by blood is the most binding sacred agreement a person can enter into. And if we can then take the fact that now we're talking about not just the blood of goats or animals, but we're now talking about the blood of God himself, the blood uh, of God's dear son, of Jesus Christ. Uh, how could he have committed himself uh, in a more extreme way? I mean, I, I want us to get that. If we don't get anything else, how could God have made a stronger statement about his commitment than to make the commitment through his own blood? We need to understand that. So here's the thing I would like for us to ask ourselves this morning. If God felt so strongly about a covenant that he wanted to make with himself through his own blood, and then open up for humanity to enter into that covenant with him. If he thought so highly of that covenant to make it with his own blood, shouldn't we think highly enough about it to, to exhaust the rest of our earthly lives going into the covenant to understand it in a greater way? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes. And so part of what we want to do today is go into that a little bit. Now, here's the thing I love. Uh, I, you know, by nature, uh, I, I, love, I, I, love, um, I love bullet points. By nature, I love one, two, three, A, B, C. Uh, that's just the way I'm wired. I understand things. Uh, if you can just say, Steve... Uh, here's number one, here's number two, here's number three, here's number four. It, may, it, it helps me. Uh, what, I, what I don't do so well with is if there's this mass of vagueness. Mass of vagueness, I just don't do well in that environment. I don't know about you. But I love the fact that in a way we could say this Bible, Old and New Testament, Old and New Covenant, in a way this is all that God has made provision for it, and it is. You've got to understand, it is. Uh, but I love the fact that he has, uh, for my sake, if nobody else has <laughs> narrowed it down and said, but so that you can get a grip on this, let me, let me put that into four categories. Uh, this, of course, Alan's been teaching us out of the prophets, and one of those prophets is Jeremiah. 
And this is found in Jeremiah 31. It's prophesied. And then Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, picks it up. And he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And here's the point I want to make. If you will go and meditate on Hebrews 8, 10 through 12, and think of it in terms of there are four things that the blood of Christ was shed for. There are four commitments that God has made, and He has made them with such absolute certainty. He has so fully committed Himself to these four things. Uh, he, will, he will move heaven and earth in every believer's life for the rest of your time on this earth to accomplish these four things. Uh, the first being, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. The second being, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I tell you, when you begin to go into these things, it's extraordinary what God has committed himself to. I mean, he has committed himself to these things. And, and then the third thing is, uh, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. I'm like Robert. Man, I, I'd love to take off right there. I'm already preparing my heart and myself for that sermon in about three weeks. Uh, oh my gosh, the price he paid for intimacy with you the, the, and, and with me. Uh, and then the fourth thing, uh, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. I'll tell you, if we ever get a hold of that one, condemnation will never grip us again, believer. If you, if you understand the commitment that has been made through the blood of Christ uh, regarding His mercy toward your sin, not just past, but present and future, if you can understand the commitment that He has made, the mercy uh, that he has, uh, and his commitment to uh, not only forgive, but to remember no more, uh, you will get off and shake off and move forward so much more quickly in this walk with the Lord. Uh, so we want to continue in this today. And, uh, the, but remember, we're talking about these four things. Uh, so go back. I encourage you. Go back and meditate on Hebrews 8, 10 through 12. Meditate on it. Go into it. Ask the Holy Spirit. Open the eyes of my understanding. Uh, Lord, open my heart to see. Uh, Lord, would you please help this not just be intellectual, but, but it would be whole heart and whole life understanding of this covenant that you have invited me into. But we really are focused um, on this one first promise, but there are two parts uh, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. Uh, so, we did, uh, I think it was May the 3rd, uh, we focused our attention on the part A. I'll say the first promise, uh, 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 part A. I will put my laws into their minds. It's important to separate these two things, and you'll see that by the end of today's sermon, I believe. Uh, it's important to separate them, to, to grasp them uh, as you need to grasp them. Uh, uh, but then once you've separated them, you really do have to bring them back together because it is one promise. It's one promise in two parts. Uh, but he has promised that he would put our laws into their minds. And to save you and me uh, a, a, a short re-preaching of last sermon, uh, let me give it to you this way. This is the Steve version of that. I will give my precepts, commands, and promises. One of the things I found, um, to be honest with you, in my own life, and I know it works the same for others if it works in my own life, uh, when I initially began this uh, fresh journey into the covenant, was I found myself tripping over the, the word laws. Uh, because part of me, I guess, I don't know if he'll ever get this completely fixed or not, but part of me always uh, hears laws, and I have this, I always have this sense of something obligatory, something I have to do, and, um, and, and so I really went into that. I needed to understand that, because even though I felt that because that word communicated that in my soul, I knew that wasn't his heart. So I really delved into that and, and came out of that delving into it with this understanding. When he says law, he's talking about three things, precepts, 
commands, and promises. Precepts, commands, and promises. I shared in my, uh, in my um, just to give you a little bit of an example of, of some of that, I, I shared in uh, one of the posts that I did, I can't remember what day it was, but, uh, but many years ago, um, I remember being a young, a young in the Lord believer. I was in my late 20s, and the truth of the matter is, I honestly just had, I had not given any thought to the issue of abortion. Uh, but then I had come to the Lord, been in the church for a few years, and I don't even remember how it came up, but, but at some point, discussion, uh, I, w I found myself in a discussion about abortion, and, and obviously in the, ch in the church it was, uh, it was from a pro-life uh, stance, and, and I remember just simply not understanding that, because maybe the way I was raised uh, somewhat liberally, uh, I mean, for me it was like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense, because of course a woman has a right to choose. And, and so uh, I remember, I don't think I get into an argument with anybody, I probably just kept my mouth shut and had that thought in my heart. Uh, but then I was reading through, uh, I, I think it was Exodus. Um, I was reading through Exodus and I read this obscure verse. This is so wild, but it shows you God's commitment to his covenant. I think it's in Exodus 22. I, I'll have to, you can go back and look at the, uh, look at the uh, post and find it if you have the patience for that. <laughs> but in this, let me tell you the short of it. Uh, in this verse, uh, the, God is given a command. He's given a precept, actually a precept. Uh, and he says, look, if two men are fighting and there's a pregnant woman there uh, and she gets hurt in the process uh, and, and gives birth prematurely, uh, it, 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 then you are to punish the one who caused harm to her according to uh, life for life, limb for limb, eye for eye. I don't know how to tell you what happened in that moment. But suddenly in a moment's time, I understood that God valued the unborn in exactly the same way he valued a fully walking around, talking human life, uh, human person. Uh, now the truth is, uh, theologically, um, uh, that would have probably taken me weeks to get to in that verse. But in a moment's time, what happened? The Holy Spirit, because of the commitment of the covenant, the Holy Spirit wrote a precept on my heart. He revealed it to my mind and he wrote it on my heart. Uh, I remember another time, um, this may be a precept or a command. I took it as a command. Uh, I, I, I alluded to this, but I remember uh, we, we, we had, as the boys were growing up, Kelly and I had always had pets. And, and one of the pets we had was Dusty, who was probably the best of the whole bunch. Um, but he was a Cocker Spaniel, and Cocker Spaniels, their hair gets long. And, and the truth of the matter is I was so focused on... Um, own work and life. Heck, I didn't have proper time for my kids and my wife. Forget a dog. And um, so that dog was not properly cared for uh, if I could just be kind to myself. Um, I didn't mistreat him, but I sure didn't treat him well. And I'm reading through Proverbs one day, and I come across this verse. I'd have to track it down for you. But I come across this verse that says, a good man takes care of the needs of his animals. Now that won't necessarily bring you to the altar, but something happened in my heart that day and I never looked back. I repented. I went to the altar of my heart and said, oh God, <laughs> oh God. And, and so there's a way. So for me, that was a command. God had written a command on my heart. Steve, you're mine now. You've committed to walk with me. You better take care of your dogs. Now, to some of you, that's silly. To me, it is not silly. And I'll tell you, that's why Kelly doesn't have a dog right now. Because <laughs> I fully understand, if I own a dog, that dog's going to cost me money and time that I don't want to give. That's just how selfish I am. So when we have that discussion, I will always remind Kelly uh, that if she will commit to walk it in the rain, which I know she won't, uh, if she will commit to do certain things, I guess I would write the checks, but I sure don't want to have to walk it at 9.30 at night in the rain when it's cold. 
But God has written that on my heart. I hope you can see that. Uh, and then there are, there are some things I remember. I wrote this in a post, too. Uh, I still remember being a, um, this was early in my walk with the Lord. And, um, and I was reading Matthew, but I was reading, I still remember this. It was this little, thin commentary. I mean, I think back and think, boy, it couldn't have said much. That thing was so thin because now my commentaries are that thick and, you know, big tomes. And uh, this was this little commentary. But I was reading through the book of Matthew, and I was reading the commentary. Now, this is not what the guy said in the commentary, but I simply uh, uh, read, this, um, read this word about mountain moving faith. I read that scripture. And the Holy Spirit in that moment said to me, uh, Steve, if you will ask me to, I will set you free from biting your fingernails. I honestly think other than salvation, that's the first time I ever heard the Lord speak to me. And it was incredible. Uh, what happened in that moment? The Holy Spirit uh, took my engaging with him in Scripture and wrote a promise on my heart. If you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move and it'll move. Uh, well, the truth is, before that moment, I, I had no faith that I could quit biting my nails. I couldn't tell you the number of times I had tried. And I tried all kinds of things, you know, putting stuff on them to make them, you know, I mean, to make it up. I mean, I tried everything, and I'd basically given up. But in a moment's time, the Holy Spirit, the one who had been committed to me through the blood of Christ, the covenant, in a moment's time, he wrote that promise on my heart. And before I could think about it, I said, yes, of course. And it was done. That mountain was moved. I won't talk about the backsliding that took place a year later. All I can tell you is the mountain moved completely, and I know that it's true. So I want you to understand that's what we're talking about. So the Lord has said, I will give my precepts, commands, and promises into their minds. Now, by the way, if, we would, if, if we'd follow that through, we would understand what he's saying is the way I think will progressively become the way they think. God's committed to you and I becoming more like him in the way we think. Now, I wanted to, to say this to you. I put that up there to remind me, but I want to make a big statement. Uh, and I think this is important in the evangelical world. Right thinking is not enough. If we're going to move in kingdom, uh, there are some things there. In fact, the truth is there are many things in this word I think rightly about. But it has not impacted my life in a radically life-changing way. There, there are a lot of promises that I honestly believe, and I, I would die for that belief. But I couldn't say to you that in this moment there is such heart faith that I could speak to that mountain and move it. And, and I think one of the things we need to do is come to a new place of humility and admit those things. Part of the reason we're afraid to hum to to, to admit that, uh, I think, is number one, we don't want to be embarrassed among, amongst people that we think have greater faith than we do. Uh, so I'm trying to at least let you see there's lots of stuff I don't have faith for, but I do believe it. <laughs> but I need God to do what he did on that fingernail biting thing. I need him to take what I know and write it on my heart. So you got to understand that. So one of the things I think if we, it, God gives grace to the humble. So I think if we can quit pretending to have what we really don't have and rest in the grace of God, continue to allow our minds to be transformed, but also then begin to expect it to impact our heart. Uh, because right thinking is not enough. So um, it would be too embarrassing to ask those who are here today, the handful in this room, to, to do this. But I'm going to ask you at home, put your hand over your mouth like this and say that. Right thinking is not enough. Right thinking is not enough. Right thinking is not enough. And that's what I really want to communicate today. Okay, if right thinking is not enough, then where do we need to go from here? That's why the Lord says he would not only give precepts, commands, and promises, his precepts, commands, and promises, into. I'm, let me personalize it, into our minds, he would also write them on their hearts. This is massive. This is what happened to me 
those three examples that I gave to you. He didn't just change the way I thought. I literally had an encounter with the Holy Spirit in which he wrote on my heart. Uh, Brian and I are sharing common language here. I, I, a better way to say it, and I guarantee the Scriptures would have used it if it were written in our day. He recoded my heart in those areas. That's massive. That's big. That's what he wants to do. But here's the reason it's so important for us to be in this series together. Uh, we are captive to our expectations. Every one of us are captive to our expectations. So what I want to do is blow the lid off of expectations so that when, as we begin to encounter promises in the Word, we can understand, okay, two things need to happen. My thinking needs to be transformed to be like God's thinking in this thing, and the Holy Spirit needs to write that on my heart. When that's done, uh, if it's a matter of... of, uh, of um, if it's a matter of faith, I'll have mountain-moving faith. And, and by the way, if it's a matter of obedience, I'll have the faith to be obedient. Uh, that's the thing we don't think about. We, we think we've got to grunt out obedience. Boy, I'm going to tell you, when you begin to walk with the Lord, when He writes something on your heart, when He changes the way you think, and He writes something on your heart, let me give you an example of, of that. Uh, there is a command that many people... Um, are greatly challenged with uh, out of, the, uh, out of uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus uh, said that we have to, he said, I know what's written, uh, but what I'm telling you is forgive your enemies and love those who persecute you or vice versa. You get the point. Uh, <laughs> that's hard to do because, I mean, when somebody has made themselves your enemy, what that means is they have done something to you that has hurt you deeply, that has cost you deeply. If you're a, uh, if you're a, a parent or if you're a grandparent, uh, I'm telling you, 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 it's one thing to be single, single young man and forgive your enemies. It's easier to forgive something done against you. When somebody does something against my children or my grandchildren, that's a whole different orbit altogether. But even then, Jesus says, we are commanded. Well, I wanted to say something to you. You ain't going to walk out that command grunting it and snorting. The only way you can walk that out is to have your mind transformed where you know, God, I agree with you. You are right. I know that needs to happen. But you cannot leave me just knowing it needs to happen. I need an encounter with you so that you write that command on my heart. Because in the writing of that command, I'm moving in obedience. Uh, that's grace. You got to understand, that's grace in action. Uh, so, so a lot of the things you've been struggling with, maybe I could just say this before we move on in, a lot of those things you've been struggling with is simply because you've got, you think right, but you've not yet gone after God. Maybe you've not known to, maybe you haven't expected to, but I want to say to you right now, some of you, there's one or two things, and it has come to mind. It has tripped you up. You've gotten no victory. You've been prayed for. I mean, every, you... Everything in you, you are so frustrated. And I'm telling you today, I'm representing the Lord saying to the, He is about to write it on your heart. And you're going to look back uh, and, and wonder at how full of grace you are to walk out a command the Lord's given you. So you get ready for that. Uh, say yes to Him. But let's move on. So what we want to do now for the rest of our time is talk about this little statement, write them on their hearts. Well, the Greek word write means write. Uh, now, for whatever reason, you can, it's, it's the same word that's used if I were to take a fountain pen and write something on a piece of paper. Uh, I think it's also the same word we could say if I were to inscribe something. Uh, but, I, but I think what we need to understand is the Lord has committed to write some things on our hearts and it's not with erasable uh, pencil. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is with an ink that's been bought by the blood of Christ. Uh, so you, you need to understand, he has committed to write some things on our hearts. It, it, it is real. Uh, I'm talking about real encounters with the Lord. I'm not talking about fuzzy thinking encounters. I'm talking about real encounters with the Lord when the Holy Spirit himself does something inside of you and you know that it's been done. 
So that's writing. Uh, but let's think for a minute about this word heart or hearts. The word cardia, it does, of course, mean this organ inside of me. Um, but, the, but from a biblical perspective, the real important application is this inmost being. And it's described in the Bible as being the wellspring of life. One version says something to, to this effect, uh, that the, um, uh, guard your heart for all of the consequences of life flow from it. Uh, so uh, we're going to get into that in, in, uh, a little bit more in just a moment. But the important thing that we understand at this point is there are a lot of things I think rightly about that my life activity does not represent my right thinking. Because I'm not living out of how I think. I'm living out of my heart. That's why, to be honest with you, that's why, uh, fi um, um, uh, what do they call it when they do um, credit checks, credit reports? That's why credit reports are so reliable. Uh, you, you can swear all day long you have changed, uh, but I'll tell you, a bank has the good sense to go back and look at what your heart has proven to be true over the last several years. So you got to understand, uh, the, the financial institutions understand the human heart better sometimes, I think, than the church does. Uh, because we're living out of the heart. Uh, I am a husband out of my heart. I'm a father and a grandfather out of my heart. I'm a pastor out of my heart. You, everything I'm doing, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, is coming out of my heart. Because really, when you come down to it, your heart is really who you are. Um, what I intend to be is not who I am. <laughs> Isn't that true? What I intend, on my best day, what I intend to be is not really who I am. Who I am is who I am on the inside. And if it weren't for Jesus, that would scare me. Because <laughs> uh, I've got enough proof after being, uh, you know, I'm coming up on 62 years old. Man, when I think if I had been left to my own if I had been left to my own devices, if, if 40 years ago the promise of Ezekiel had not been true for me that he gave me a new heart, he took out the heart of stone and he, and he put in a heart of, of flesh, it's almost like uh, I mean, even, our, even uh, um, CDs, I can't even use that anymore because do you know what a CD is? See, you don't even know what a CD is. I mean, forget about a, a cassette tape or a VH. What is it? V8? Uh, that's, a, that's a drink. An 8-track. I mean, uh, I mean they, they, we used to use these things called CDs, and they were round and about that big. And, and, uh, and they had two kinds. One was writable, and the other you couldn't write on. One was read only, the other's right. And so in a way, before Jesus, before the new covenant, in a way you could write on it, uh, you could write on the heart, and lots was written on it. Brian's example of his grandparents was a wonderful example today of their heart being written on uh, in, in the Great Depression. Um, but that old human heart, it could not be rewritten upon. But the heart God has given us now through the new covenant, it can be rewritten upon. And that's a glorious thing. And that's, that's why we can even talk about what we're talking about today. Uh, but here's the question. I posed this in, um, in uh, my post a couple of days ago, to, uh, Friday, I think, to get you thinking about this ahead of today's sermon. Why is it important for God to write his precepts, commands, and promises on our hearts? Uh, I would go on to say, what is the purpose? Well, I hope by now, this far into the sermon, this, that's already fairly obvious. But I want to I point out two things to you, uh, and, and I want to do this because I really want God, I'm asking, in fact, let's just pause, Lord, sear these two things into our hearts and minds. I'm asking you to do it, Lord. Number one, uh, Proverbs, that famous verse, Proverbs 4.23, in the NIV uh, says, everything you do flows from it, meaning the heart. Guard your heart with all diligence because, this is old 
covenant. I mean, think about that. He was making a statement, man, that, that thing wasn't, you write it on your heart, it ain't going to change. <laughs> you better guard it because whatever's written, it's going to stay written in a sense. Uh, uh, but even today, we, we know this is true. Um, everything you do flows from your heart. Now, think about this with me for a minute. Think about what Jesus said uh, in Matthew 12, 34. Out of the abundance of the heart, uh, the mouth speaks. Now, I don't know about you, and I'm certainly not going to with, I'm certainly not going to say this publicly online, being recorded. I'm not going to give you examples. <laughs> but boy, I could sure think of some things that I said out of my mouth that I would never have said if, if I were just working completely out of my mind. You understand? I've said some dumb things that when I got back, I had to say, but it was in your heart. <laughs> <laughs> if, you had, if you had 30 seconds to put a muzzle over your mouth, you might have done it, but it would have still been in your heart. From the abundance of, of the heart, the mouth speaks. But Jesus also said this, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. That's a short list. He could, it's obvious. He could go on and on. There is, what I find interesting in, that Greek, in, in the Greek in that verse, there is no and. There's like, what he's saying is, uh, I'm not stopping here. It could go on. Uh, all of these evil things. Look at all the evil. Look at the things you have done that uh, now you look back on and you're horrified. L look at the way you've treated people in times past. Uh, now you look back and you're horrified by the way you acted toward them or you treated people. Uh, uh, th th think of the, look around and see the heart in action uh, in all of these ways and many, many more. Um, but here's the good news. We are in a new covenant. Jesus, knowing that, look what, what he also said in Luke 8, 15. I love the, the Passion Translation for this. The seed that fell into good fertile soil represents those lovers of truth who hear it within, deep within their hearts. I love that. Let's read that again. Let's go back to that. Because now we're in a new covenant. Jesus was looking ahead all of those three and a half years. Jesus was looking ahead uh, to the new covenant that he was bringing into the earth. Uh, you can't read it uh, from, from a old covenant mindset. You just simply can't. Jesus is preparing a people. He's preparing a, uh, he's preparing a, a text uh, recollections, stories, um, uh, concepts, principles. He's preparing these things for a people who will be bought by, the blood, by his own blood at some point. And to those people with that reality, he says, the seed that fell into good fertile soil represents those lovers of truth who hear it deep within their hearts. They respond by clinging to the word. It's written in my heart, now I'm clinging to it, keeping it dear as they endure all things in faith. Uh, this is the seed that will one day bear much fruit in their lives. And I just say to you, that fruit will come from precepts, commands, and promises. But much fruit will come from those who allow their heart to be rewritten on. But let's move on. So why, why is it important for God to write these things on our heart? Number one, everything you do flows from it. But number two, I've alluded to this a number of times, and in a, in a way, in my heart, this is what I really want to say today. Uh, with the heart, one believes. This is out of Romans 10.10. Uh, uh, 10. This is such an absolutely critical foundational principle. This principle doesn't just apply to salvation. It, it, it applied to salvation, but it doesn't just apply to salvation. The principle is a kingdom principle. With the heart, I believe. With the heart, I have faith for whatever it may be. Now, let's think about what Jesus said. He backs this principle up uh, saying it this way. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt, where? In his heart. But believes, now you could pause here and very easily say, believes where? Well, of course. I mean, it's 
totally implied, but believes in his heart. If the doubt's in the heart, then the belief is in the heart that what he says will come to pass and it will be done for him. Now, don't, um, don't hear what I'm not saying because I don't want you to shortcut something. Uh, but there are some encounters with God uh, that, that you've had, I'm sure I've had. Uh, that, you know, one of the things I'm, um, I've been amazed at as I read, I'm thinking, I won't say who they are, but I'm thinking about three or four major um, communicators uh, regarding uh, God's healing as part of the covenant. I'm thinking of, of three or four right now. Do you know every one of them experienced healing before they really, um, their minds were radically changed to the fact? In other words, uh, the encounter of writing it on the heart happened, and then they had to go back and have their minds changed. Because if, if, if that happens, your mind can actually smother out. That's why people can be in a service or be in a prayer pod or be in an encounter, and there's, there's this moment of absolute faith. Uh, and it's real. It's not fake. It's not mind control. It's not manipulation. It is absolutely real. God, the Holy Spirit in that moment, is writing upon the heart, and some Something happens. Uh, but then you really do need, if your mind is not already thinking like God in that thing, you really do have to make your primary order of business with God for however long it takes bringing your mind into alignment with that miracle. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, usually, uh, it, the, the, it, the, uh, the mind comes first and, and then the heart, but it doesn't always happen that, that way. Um, but here's the point, um, as Trevor says, but I digress. Uh, believing in the heart, Jesus clearly communicates that principle. So let's move on. Now, I want you to, this is another one of those little statements I hope just to drive into you today. Uh, it's really important. Right thinking will not move mountains. That's a pause for effect. Right thinking will not move mountains. Authentic heart faith will. New life, I'm calling us. I'm calling myself and each one of you to leave behind thinking that just getting our thinking fixed will bring about God's purpose. It will not. Over the long term, God's purpose can't be fulfilled unless that happens. But you got to have both right thinking and a radically touched heart, heart faith. But let's move on. Charles Price, I love how he said it. Uh, by the way, if you, if you would like... Um, a book. There's, I'll give you one next week as well, but if you wanted one book that deals with faith, the issue of faith, and you only had time to read with one, read one, I would encourage you to get Charles Price's book, The Real Faith. It's tremendous. It's simple. Uh, it's powerful. It's, it's not terribly long, uh, but it is so powerful. But he writes this in his book, The Real Faith. We have made faith a condition of the mind when it is a divinely imparted grace of the heart. I want to read that one more time. We have made faith a condition, <coughs> excuse me, of the mind when it is a divinely imparted grace of the heart. You may ask, well, Steve, why in the world are you harping on this so much? We got it. Move on. Well, let me tell you, because by and large, we think once we see it and understand it with our mind, the journey's finished. And I want to go on record today that the journey is not finished. That's critically important because the ideal is for the Spirit of God to write a promise, a precept, a command on a heart, and the soil of thought 
the soil of thought be so absolutely in line with that writing that there are no weeds to choke it out. But we, we've got to make sure we understand that to get our thinking right is only part of the journey. It's only part of the process. So please, I pray today, if you don't get anything else, get that, and get it with humility. Uh, let's start being honest. Let's start looking at our prayers and seeing when, God act, when our prayers actually moved a mountain or frankly, it didn't move. Why don't we get real honest about that and then go back to the Lord and say, but God, you made a covenant with your own blood and you have committed that you will not only help me understand with my mind what your will looks like, but you've made a commitment to write a faith-producing uh, that, 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 in a faith-producing way on my heart. So, Lord, I'm holding you to your commitment that you made through the blood of Christ. I hope you can get that. I'm sure that was probably poorly said, but I, th I think it communicates if you'll meditate on it. Uh, John G. Lake, I want to finish with the story. Uh, I shared this. I, I love this story uh, because I've... Um, I still can't get my head around it. But John G. Lake was a, a missionary. You, we, most of us know him as the founder of the healing rooms out of uh, the northwest area of the country, Washington and, and thereabouts. Um, before that, he was a missionary in uh, South Africa in that part of the world. Uh, I think from 19... 08 to 1913, something like that. But it his time there coincided with the bubonic plague. Now, the bubonic plague, let me just go on record, is worse than COVID-19. <laughs> let's just say, let's just go on record. COVID-19 can't even carry water for the bubonic plague. Um, I mean, it, I mean, if you got the bubonic plague, there wasn't any, any, any help for you, really. I mean, you were a goner. That, that was the truth. And everybody knew it. And the, the going out was so devastating. Uh, the, the effect it had on the human body and the dying process was so brutal and devastating. People were utterly, uh, um, you think there's fear in the world. I mean, they were utterly afraid. Um, and they protected themselves in every conceivable way. And one of the things John G. Lake says, and I take it to be factual, he said, uh, he says, you could not pay somebody a thousand dollars to go into a house and bring out a corpse of one who had died from the bubonic plague. Because they understood that the germ on that would very likely infect them, and they would be one of the next corpses coming out. I don't mean to make light of that. <laughs> it's dead serious, but it does feel a bit humorous right now. <laughs> uh, but you get the point. Uh, but here's the thing. I, I love John G. Lake uh, because... He and, he never gives the guy's name, uh, Dutchman's all you know. Uh, I mean, frankly, I think the guy deserves at least his name being known throughout the earth because he and this n unknown Dutchman together as partners would go into homes and pull out corpses and bury them. And they did that for months on end. And uh, at some point, uh, someone asked him, someone kind of in authority asked him, what do you use to protect yourself with? He said, nothing. Not physically. How do you explain that? <laughs> well, this is, I cannot get my head around this, by the way. The truth is, um, I, 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 to this day, I've tried to get there theologically. I guarantee you there's not a commentator on the face of the earth that could get to this just purely from a mind standpoint. But all of that came from Romans 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now I'm telling you, what happened? In a way, I still, I've thought about this for months now. I still cannot explain it, except, though it be far more glorious than a young guy who couldn't quit biting his fingernails, the concept's the same. <laughs> 
Though, though it's far more important than a guy not taking care of his conquer spaniel and being encountered through the Holy Spirit with a precept um, uh, or a command, uh, you, you, you get my point. But somehow, some way, the Holy Spirit wrote on John G. Lake's heart in such a way that he had this mountain-moving faith that the bubonic plague could not touch him. And by his own words, what he described was, this was his logic. This was his revelation. I'm not going to say, this was his revelation. As long as I'm walking closely with God, every germ that touches my body will die. And so he challenged this guy. This blows my mind. So he challenges this guy who asked him, what kind of protection do you wear? He says, well, we don't wear any. Our protection is in Romans 8.2, the promise of Romans 8.2. Uh, and he says, perhaps, he says this this way, perhaps you would like to do an experiment. You go to that corpse and take, a, um, and take some of the living uh, bacteria, whatever it is, germ, uh, you bring that from that corpse and lay it on my skin, and let's bring a microscope, and you observe, I guarantee you when it hits my skin, it will die. Guess what happened? It died. I ain't there yet. I went to AutoZone yesterday, and I wore a mask. <laughs> I was the only one in AutoZone, all those men who work on cars. I was the only wimp in there with a mask. I don't have this revelation, right? I don't have this revelation. But the point being, the Holy Spirit did write it on John G. Lake's heart. How many promises, how many precepts, how many glorious commands await you and me? How many things can God write on your heart and my heart? And people look on it, read about it later. Not that we desire that, but other people see this is a real kingdom. This kingdom's having an impact. This, this is not, these people don't just think things. Things happen in their life. This matters. This is real. This kingdom is alive, and it's, and it's life impacting, and it's world impacting. See, God wants to raise up a body uh, who will allow the Holy Spirit to write upon their hearts. So let's close with this. I will give my precepts, commands, and promises into their minds and will inscribe them on their hearts, recoding who they are at the deepest level of their being. So I want to ask you today, what one thing
Thank you, New Life, so much for being here today. We are uh, blessed for our online family. We're blessed for the uh, your participation, your comments that you send in, your prayer request. We're blessed just to have you here with us. Uh, throughout the day, we had some prayer requests come in. Uh, the first one is from Laura Brown, and it's um, it's prayers for the family as she um, as she feels her mother will be joining the Lord soon. So we just want to lift up um, lift up her family, and we want to um, we just want to pray over this. So, dear Heavenly Father, we pray for Laura and her family, Lord. Lord, we know that um, your will be done in all situations, Lord. We know that you protect us and you guide us and that you care for us. And we know that your love conquers all, Lord. So, Lord, we uh, reach out to you right now, Lord, for uh, this family. Lord, we ask that you lift up Laura's mother, Lord. That you uh, encourage her, that you strengthen her, Lord, in the situation that she's in. This season in her life, Lord. Lord, we pray for blessings to be upon Laura's family, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you uh, bring comfort, joy, and love to this family even now, Lord. Lord, we ask them, we ask you, Lord, that you help them to look beyond the ways of man and the things that happen to us in this earthly body, Lord, and that you help them to find the joy and the peace and knowing that there's so much more and such a beautiful, eternal future waiting for all of us, Lord. And Lord, we thank you in, in the ways that you care for us and that you just bring comfort, Lord. So we just, we love you and we're blessed by you, Lord Jesus. And we just pray blessings into Lord's family's life in every way imaginable, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. But Lord, we'd like to uh, lift up Neil Martin's sister, Shelly. Uh, her partner, Greg, passed away recently. And uh, we just want to pray for uh, Shelly and the family here. So Father God, we... Um, Lord, we know that uh, Greg is in a better place, Lord, that he is just dancing on streets of gold right now, Lord, praising and worshiping you, Lord, enjoying an eternal life, Lord, that we all yearn for, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for the way that you've taken Greg, Lord, and that you will care for him forever, Lord. Lord, we lift up Shelly and her family, Lord, today. Lord, we pray that you help them get past this period of mourning, Lord that you show them a better way, Lord, that you show them the joy and the peace that they can have in their heart, Lord, knowing that Greg is in a better place, Lord. Lord, we pray blessings on to Shelly and her family, Lord, in every way imaginable. Lord, we pray for financial blessings if, if they need it, Lord. Lord, we pray for just comfort and strength, Lord, for, for you just to build them up, Lord, and to bring them happiness in their life to come, Lord. We thank you for the way that you're with us every day, Lord, and we bless you the way that you bless us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, we'd like to lift up Jackie Hanselman, Lord. Lord, she cares for her mother. And uh, we know that in our age, as we get older, that our, our bodies become frail, Lord. And Lord, we pray for strength to be with Jackie's mother, Lord, that the simple tasks that we take for granted each day, Lord, Lord, we ask that you build up strength in not only Jackie, but in Jackie's mother, Lord, that the simple task of caring for someone in the day-to-day -day activities be a little less, a little easier to handle, Lord. We pray for comfort to be in this family, Lord. We pray for blessings, Lord. We pray for those that can help Jackie to be able to help Jackie, Lord. Lord, we just pray for, for your presence, Lord, to just envelop this family, Lord, to lift them all up, Lord, to bring strength that they never knew that they had, Lord in this season in their lives, Lord. We thank you for everything that you're doing in Jackie's life, Lord. We see the love that she has for you, Lord, and the ministry that was birthed from that. So, Lord, we just pray, Lord, for just supernatural strength to be upon Jackie in this time, Lord. We thank you for the way that you walk with her. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, this last request is for Jonathan Shepard, Lord. Lord, I hold such a such a love for Jonathan in my heart for the things that he's shown me in my walk with Christ, Lord. So, Lord, I pray that you lift Jonathan up now in this time, Lord. He needs you. He needs the strength, Lord, that only you can provide. Lord, he feels troubled and burdened with things, Lord. So, Lord, we pray that you free his heart. That you take away any burdens that may chain him down, Lord, that you lift him up, 
that you bring joy and encouragement to his life, Lord, to let him know that right now, Jonathan, you are enough just as you are. The Lord takes care of everything else. Open your heart up to the Lord. Allow his love and his presence to flow freely through you, Jonathan. Know that your love for him is so strong and so deep that right now, anything that you hear other than that is a lie. And it's a lie brought to you by the enemy. So you stand up strong today, Jonathan. You don't fall prey to this in any way, shape, or form. You are exactly enough for the kingdom right now as you are. Lord, we pray blessings into Jonathan's life, Lord, for his finances, his spiritual well-being, Lord, his health, his relationships, Lord. We pray blessings into this. And we thank you, Lord, for the things that you've done for Jonathan in the past, Lord. And we look for great things to happen to him in the future. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' holy name, we pray over this and every prayer request that's come in, Lord, that your presence be the mighty deciding factor in all of this, Lord. We trust in you. We have faith in you, Lord. We believe in your, pre your power, your healing, your presence. And we are so blessed by you, Lord. We glorify you. We praise your holy name today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Online family, we love you so much. We are encouraged by your participation. This house will be open soon to you. Be filled with faith this week. Walk in blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Online family, we look forward to seeing you here soon. We just love you. Have a blessed week.